Hey, I'm going to get things kicked. Awesome. That was good time, man. Uh, I'm going to get things kicked off for everyone. Uh, thanks everyone for joining tonight and, um, or I guess it might be afternoon if you're joining from the West Coast, um, if some folks are there. Um, my name is Jen Suha. I use he, him pronouns. Um, for the Victories Next Gen Network, I'm one of the co-leads. Uh, ben Schuster, also on here, um, is also on here. And I don't see, we have a third, don't see her right now, but uh, also on the call as, uh, I think we'll join as well. Uh, the Victory Next Gen Network is um, a place for everyone who is under 40 um, LGBT and invested in growing LGBTQ political power. This could be by supporting candidates, this could be for canvassing, this could be just by becoming more informed. Um, we host three events um, that are virtual and then also two in-person events. So we'll share those a bit later on. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Victory Fund um, or Victory Institute, um, it's a national organization dedicated to um, both training and also supporting um, and electing LGBTQ pro-choice candidates. Um, and so um, it helps people up and down the ballot. So this is all the way from president um, to city councils, to school board members that we're about to talk about today, um, to state legislatures, um, courts, like you, um, we were talking about the Wisconsin Supreme Court just now. Um, so all up and down the ballot there. Um, so, like I mentioned, we're going to host quarterly events. Uh, we have three virtual events and two for in-person events. So I know that's not completely quarterly, so we have a little bit more. Um, but this is our kickoff for 2023. So thank you so much for joining us um, this year. Um, our focus for today is going to be on school boards um, and also the attacks on LGBTQ folks um, that are happening in schools and education. Uh, so, right, if you could take us to the next slide. So um, in July of 2022, the Victory Institute published a report called Few and Under Fire, uh, and it's about LGBTQ school board members in the U.S. Public schools in the U.S. have been under increasingly fervent attacks in the past few years. LGBTQ students, teachers, and administrators have faced the brunt of this vitriol, making LGBTQ representation on school boards more important than ever. So some of the key findings from the um, report um, is that LGBTQ people are severely underrepresented on school boards in the U.S. There are approximately 90,000 school board members across the U.S. Only 90 of them are known to be members of the LGBTQ community. So that's just 0.1% of all school board members. Yet we also know LGBTQ people make up at least 7.1% of U.S. adults. And we can guess that there's a similar number, if not higher, among children as well. So of LGBTQ school board members um, that were surveyed, 47% 40 um, had been the target of anti-LGBTQ verbal attacks as a school board candidate. 51% had been the target of anti-LGBTQ verbal attacks as a school board member. And 17% had been the target of anti-LGBTQ verbal attacks from a fellow member of the school board. Uh, more than one third of the respondents face threats to their safety and 6.4% uh, received death threats as school board member or candidate, as a member or a candidate. Um, and then 62% of survey respondents stated that supporting LGBTQ students was a primary motivation for running for a school board position. Um, and 87% have actually put forward pro LGBTQ policies or legislation during their time as a school board member. So um, those are pretty sobering stats, but it's also really, really exciting that people who are running who are LGBTQ um, are largely motivated to help um, make sure that our schools are safe and inclusive for everyone. Um, so I'm really, really excited today to introduce um, our panelists. Um, I do want to make a quick note that Dr. Tyler Titus um, was scheduled to be um, here tonight. Um, they are a victory endorsed candidate for the Erie County Executive and was previously the president um, the, of the Erie County um, School Board, uh, but they had a family emergency is unable to attend tonight, so they send their regrets. Um, so we missed Tyler's voice, um, but they said, uh, but we have some really, really great folks um, joining us today. Uh, first off, we have Aaron Reed. Um, Aaron Reed is a public speaker and queer legislative researcher. And I'm just gonna say right now, if you do not subscribe to Aaron's Substack and at least follow Aaron's Twitter, do that immediately. Um, we also have Representative Alistair Chang. Uh, he is a member of the DC Board of Education. Um, I'm also excited to have Alistair here because he was also one of my mentors when I did uh, the Victory Institute's um, Empowerment Fellowship. So what I wanna do right now is if you're able to go ahead and I know I gave you a brief um, introduction of it, but if you can please introduce yourself with your name, pronouns, your current position. And if you could also just speak a bit about your background, current position and how you first got involved um, in politics and all these worlds right here. Uh, so why don't we start with Aaron? 
Yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Um, my name is Erin Reed. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I am a queer legislative researcher and activist. Um, I also do independent reporting on all of the legislation uh, that's targeting the LGBTQ community with a particular focus on transgender individuals. Um, my background originally um, was in research. I, I did political research uh, originally and then started to track healthcare resources for transgender people, mapping out all of the informed consent clinics in the United States. I then transitioned to working on um, legislative issues and electoral issues around LGBTQ candidates, LGBTQ people, and laws that target us. Um, like you had mentioned, I do keep a newsletter. It's Aaron in the Morning. Uh, you can Google that or Aaron in the Morning.substack.com. And I am always watching the legislative and electoral cycles, especially as it pertains to the local school boards, because I truly believe that school boards and local elections are where a lot of the current genesis of anti trans legislation stems from, as well as anti LGBTQ legislation stems from. And the more effort that we as a community put into our local elections and into our local school boards, the more that will play out for our benefit in the larger elections and the larger issues that face our society. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. Thank you for being here today. Um, Alistair, if you can uh, jump off and share a little bit more about who you are. Thanks, Jinsu. And Erin, it's an honor to be on this with you. Uh, folks on the call, thanks for joining. Uh, I'm calling from DC where it's a lovely night out. So uh, thank you for staying inside if you're also experiencing this good weather. I, uh, I work in, uh, I, you know, I, my, my, my thing is literacy and I've been working at advancing literacy for, um, a long time. My, 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 um, parents, uh, uh, my, my dad is not particularly well educated, did not get a chance to finish elementary school and, and always instilled in me a value of education being something that he didn't quite fully understand, but knew was helpful and important and valuable. And um, uh, I quickly learned that, uh, you know, he had to work around a lot of things because he couldn't read. And um, so for me, my top priority on the board has always been to advance literacy. And uh, in DC, it's dire, right? Uh, only 26% of our fourth graders performed at a proficient or better uh, in, in this last round of, of tests. And um, that means 74% of students in our nation's capital are not reading at grade level by fourth grade. Um, as a comparison, Singapore is like 99% reading <laughs> at grade level by fourth grade, right? So uh, this, this has been something that uh, I think that it's what motivated me to run, right? And I used to work with uh, public libraries on the summer slide of literacy outcomes and decided to run for office during the pandemic when I saw that the summer slide was becoming much more of an extended slump in literacy outcomes uh, as, as students weren't able to be in school. And, and as uh, our test scores are still almost directly correlated with the uh, socioeconomic class of the family, right? And so there's just a lot, a lot of work for public education and, and a lot of work for us to uh, do, you know, across the board, right? Um, to help these students be able to navigate the world. And that's why I decided to, to run for office. Awesome. Um, this is a topic that's near and dear to me. I'm a former teacher. Um, I also worked in school districts and I still continue to work in education. And, you know, how do we make sure that schools continue to be safe spaces? Because, um, you know, like Alistair mentioned, like schools serve so many functions, right? Like literacy, like we have to teach kids how to like learn to read and do all these things, but they can't learn to read necessarily if they're not feeling safe or there are other needs that need to be met. Uh, so thank you so much to both of you for bringing your perspectives. Um, I'll also um, say to the participants, there will be time for Q&A. Uh, so definitely feel free to put anything in the chat if you have questions and we'll save them for the end. Um, so if something comes up, feel free to either save it or put it on here and Ben will be mod or, or um, you can also, if you don't feel comfortable putting it publicly, uh, feel uh, free to send a direct message to Ben Schuster. All right. Um, you know, this is something that we've just been, we're, you know, just a month and a half into 2023, and we've already seen more than 300 anti-LGBTQ bills um, introduced, like about half of which target schools and education. So what are your thoughts on this sharp ramp up in attacks and what does this mean for the future? Um, Aaron, do you want to take that one first? 
Yeah, I think so. I would like to talk about that. Um, I, I So again, I, I track LGBTQ legislation and I would say that school related LGBTQ bills are second only to the healthcare bans and they are very common. They're proliferating in the United States. And as I mentioned in my introduction, I personally believe that a lot of this is driven by many of the policies that got pushed from groups like Moms for Liberty and other um, child and parental rights campaign groups uh, led by people like Bernadette Royals and the Alliance Defending Freedom. There's a large network of um, anti-LGBTQ organizations that have been trying very hard to ensure that um, anti-LGBTQ policies end up in our schools. And the way that they did it, and, and they did it to some success, was through the use of local um, action around school boards. My apologies for my cat. <laughs> um through local actions around school boards and so you know we saw moms for liberty groups um you know sort of come all wearing the same t-shirt in mass at some of these school board meetings and and one thing that i always like to say is it is so important for people to realize that like some of the most effective advocacy you can do for the community is at that local level is showing up to these school boards because i can tell you having covered many of the school board meetings during the non-legislative cycle um Whenever the LGBTQ parents showed up, whenever the allies showed up, it made a difference. The, the anti-trans policies didn't get pushed through. They didn't get forced through. And so I think that in large part, one of the reasons why we're seeing some of these laws now at the state level is because the people were able to fight so effectively in many of these local school board elections. And so now we do have to look at ensuring that you know we are protecting our school districts not only at the local level, but also lobbying our local representatives to ensure that our school boards are kept um, are kept safe for LGBTQ individuals because they are one of the only places where trans and queer people and LGBTQ people can be themselves openly and freely without judgment. And Alistair, um, you know, DC is a, a bit of a different place, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, so I, I'd love to kind of hear from you. Um, what have you seen have been some inclusive policies that you've been able to work on? And what are some of the benefits you've seen in supporting LGBTQ students? And if I remember correctly, some of these have been pushed by LGBTQ students themselves and come to you. So uh, yeah. we'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, uh, DC is a bubble. And so I'll take this as a chance to brag about some of our student leaders one of our student representatives, Leif Bernstadt, who's a senior in high school currently, she has been leading the charge of making sure that we have LGBTQ plus inclusive education standards, right? So weaving that through, we're, we're revising our social study standards right now. Um, she, she and I have been working together to make sure that, um, you know, we are teaching this and it's embedded into our standards from uh, from early, early, early on. And to be to be honest, it it hasn't been a sticking point, right? It's not it's not something that uh, folks are pushing against. More often than not, people are saying, "Oh, we just forgot," right? And so the the the, <laughs> the even when folks aren't anti. Some, you know, uh, I think it, it's uh, it's not something that, right, I think representation super matters. Uh, Jinsu, you, you named that severe, there's severe underrepresentation. And even in this bubble that we have in DC, I think that representation makes a huge difference because it's something that, you know, so much of what happens at the local level is um, there's so much to do. And even, <laughs> even if it's not a fight, uh, it, it takes a lot of work to raise the issue and to shepherd something all the way through, right? And so to make sure that we have folks uh, on these boards to make sure that to, to actually do that uh, is, is also really important. Uh, I also I, I also live in a bit of a bubble with Chicago, and you know, as um, Aaron just put in that there's eight states that have fully LGBTQ plus inclusive curriculum. Um, Illinois, thankfully, is one of them as well. Um, but as you noted, it's important to have these um, lights to kind of show what's possible. Um, I'm unfortunately seeing the discussion of what's happening in Tennessee today, um, which has been really pretty upsetting news. And so it's know that there are places that serve as examples of ways um, that are doing things right. Um, and it's on the one hand, exciting, and it can be a little bit discouraging if you're in there, but it's uh, knowing that there's models that can be pushed on there. Um, so with that in mind, um, 
Aaron, I'm wondering, you know, there's so much political vitriol. You mentioned Moms for Liberty and other hate groups that are kind of coming out um, and organizing on there. So how can national LGBTQ advocacy orgs, local organizations uh, be changing tactics and what should they be doing differently to fight the anti-LGBTQ bills and help um, LGBTQ children and particularly transgender children and their families? I've got a lot of really good answers for this because I've gotten oh. to witness some of the really effective ways that this policy has, that, that these policies have been pushed back on. Number one, I think that one of the most important things that we as adults can do is to empower the children themselves to be good activists and act advocates themselves. We saw whenever Glenn Youngkin proposed um, a model of anti-trans policy, a set of policies that he was going to force onto all of the schools in Virginia, and that is still going on right now. This, this issue is still going on. Um, Glenn Youngkin had used, in fact, a law that was designed to make LGBTQ inclusion mandatory in schools and wrote discrimination into that law in order to backdoor discrimination into every school. As a result of that, though, the students themselves were, they got together and they staged mass walkouts all over the state. And we're talking tens of thousands of students walked out of their schools and protested the policies. As a result, many of the local school boards, places like Arlington, Richmond, um, they rejected the curriculum standards. They said, you're not gonna enforce this. You can't enforce this on us and we refuse to enforce it for you. And, and as a result, like we saw real action occur. We're seeing this in several other states right now. We're seeing strong student movements in places like Florida and places like Tennessee. I am currently working with several groups to trying to um, signal boost them whenever they are planning student walkouts. So I think that's one element of something that's been very effective. But I also think that the teachers themselves can be very powerful. Having sat through many legislative hearings around school board related issues and school issues, the teachers showing up themselves and talking about their personal experiences with LGBTQ students has moved people. We saw this in Ohio, whenever the Ohio Board of Education uh, got together, they were going to pass a statewide bathroom ban for all of their transgender students, as well as a statewide sports ban and pronoun bans, all the nine yards. And, and the teachers, some of the most powerful testimony came from teachers, some of the, some of the testimony went, went viral. And the school board specifically said afterwards to some of the advocates and to some of the teachers and, and the kids that were there, I was going to vote for this bill or for this policy, but it was hearing from you that like that changed my mind. And so, you know, professional activism is so huge. I think that like cultivating it within your classroom, within your school, within your school board, and then taking all of those advocates that have learned how to be strong leaders for their kids and strong leaders for their community locally sending those people on whenever these policies do hit the state level is so important. In a way, it's kind of like building a stable of people who learn how to be good activists. And Erin, this is, I know there's a bit of an underlying assumption here that like we kind of know the impact, but can you just kind of share like when these bills, like if these bills pass, like what are the impact it will have on LGBTQ students and their families? Like what, like if some of these proposed bills have passed, like what's going to happen and what like what do we need to fight against? Yeah, let me let me let me first just start by saying what inclusion means to LGBTQ kids. The Trevor Project recently did a study showing that having an inclusive school cuts the risk of suicide by one by two thirds, so it drops into one third of what they originally were at. Um, for transgender people, this was originally thirty three percent was dropped down to eleven percent if their schools were inclusive. And, and that's irrespective of being on like gender affirming care or having a, a, a respectful home. Like this is just having a, a good school. So it means a lot at the school level, at the student level to each individual student. Um, but then like going further on the negative side of things, just these policies being proposed and being pushed and being debated openly while kids are sitting there waiting to see how they're respected and, and how they're going to be treated by their by their teachers by their schools that can have a profoundly detrimental effect on on trans kids and on lgbtq kids in general um the 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 levels of stress over over anti-trans and anti-queer policies are very high trevor project just last year um did a study showing that um 81%, I believe, is the, is the percentage of LGBTQ students who saw anti-LGBTQ legislation and felt, felt mentally harmed by that legislation, felt that their, that their mental health had uh, deteriorated as a result. And so fighting for these kids is important. These kids seeing somebody up there and fighting visibly is really important. And then going back around to what we're talking about here in general, representation is important because it, it is so important to see somebody like you standing up 
for your rights and knowing that like even if even if everything fails you've got that voice you you feel empowered there's a voice that represents you in the halls of power it's i mean i think that representation those stats that you just showed like and i mean those worries about you know contemplating suicide those numbers are just super worrisome so how can we make sure to fight that um and so thanks to everyone for joining this call on here um and the work that everyone is doing there um Alistair, I'd love to hear, you know, you've been on um, the board now, you've been doing work um, in schools. There's a million things, like you said, right? School, I work in education as well. Like, I know, like, literacy is a top priority, like, school, like, safety is a priority. There's so many things that are on there. Uh, we'd love to just kind of hear, like, you know, what has your experience been like on um, being a school board member? And um, particularly being an LGBTQ school, school, LGBTQ school board member working in the education field, what has that experience been like? I love it. And if anyone on this call is considering running, um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, certainly worth doing. Uh, I, I named earlier that there's a lot of low hanging fruit that just doesn't have someone to raise or shepherd across. Um, and, and so much of what happens in local, local politics is actually very unsexy, right? It's the take out the trash style work that unfortunately we just don't have enough people to get done. Um, and so when I think about, you know, the, the stuff that I've been able to do, it's been a lot of that. And I really love that, that I can see the difference that that makes in a, in a lot of, uh, for, for a lot of students day to day. And um, one, one thing that I think, uh, just building off of what what Aaron was saying that I found really powerful um and you know for those those of you on this call who don't want to run but uh may, <laughs> are willing to show up for some of these hearings and and to testify uh, it's it's um it's hard to cut through the noise of uh to get a sense of you know what what do our constituents let's say actually want right and so often it's the loudest person who who always comes to the meetings, who does create a lasting impact on how we think about the issue because it is someone who might have a personal story to share, right? How representative that is of everyone is, is actually quite difficult to suss out. Um, and often I find it uh, really uh, encouraging actually, and again, DC might be a bubble, that folks who you know may have thought, my, my colleagues and I, who may have thought one way about a particular issue are, uh, may, may think quite differently at, you know, Wednesday night at 11 p.m. after everyone gets three minutes to testify at our meetings, right? And and um, and it, it, it does actually uh, shape the way that we think about these issues because there's the academic side to it that we can read up on and, 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 and that doesn't necessarily uh, always catch up with, you know, how people are actually experiencing the policy. Uh, and so, really uh, want to echo what what Aaron was saying about um, encouraging that kind of uh, engagement right and and um, I also want to give a plus one to supporting our students they know way better than we do what they need and and one thing that uh, you know I've been learning a lot along the way I, I don't know you know I, I'm not a mental health expert um, but we talk about it all the time in schools right now it's such a huge um, huge issue that people throw around as a phrase uh, every day. <laughs> um, and and when, it, when you ask the students uh, how they're actually experiencing mental health investments that we've made, and DC being one of most places that have made millions and millions of dollars of investments in mental health resources, it, it breaks my heart when they tell me, you know, I haven't felt a single dollar of that investment in my day to day. Um, and so much of it uh, in their perspective, when they tell me about it is, you know, it, it's, um, it's not what I'm not, what I'm looking for uh, is actually, you know, so, someone to not, not another adult necessarily to, to talk to, but actually, you know, break me out of this isolation, right? And so um, uh, what, what Leave and, and many other, uh, several other student uh, leaders have done is, and that I'm really excited to work on is we're starting a queer prom in DC because that's what they thought would actually, you know, when, when, when I asked them like what would actually help, right? It's, it's, things, it's things that they come up with that I get really excited about. And, um, 
And so for, for anyone in the area who's willing to be a chaperone at the end of May, um, uh, we're, that, that's one thing that I think we're gonna try. And those are the kinds of things that really get me excited. That's awesome. And I love the way that you're, you know, have, like listening directly from students because, you know, they're able to express those needs so much. Um, and Queer Prom looks like you have at least one volunteer uh, who will be there. There are several DC members, so we'll definitely uh, be advertising that to members on here. Um, Alistair, as we mentioned there's only 90 known LGBTQ school members, uh, school board members. You're part of the 0.1% um, on there, uh, which is a tiny number. Um, and as you know, we all talked about representation really matters, you know, being able to see someone on there, but also even be able to be there to kind of help shepherd and like, kind of raise importance of these issues. Um, and, you know, potentially even be like a safe space for someone who may not be willing to testify to come and be like, I know at least there's one friendly voice um, on there. I'm curious, um, how do you, how do we incentivize more LGBTQ people to run for school board? Um, what because you, know, you know they may say this isn't my role or this is my world on there. What are some ways that we can potentially um, get people to run? It's a great question. Uh, I I love. I mean, I love what the Victory Institute and Victory Fund are doing. Right? There's. I mean, it's it's the it's so hard to do alone. Right? So having this kind of support, not just during the campaign. Right? But but throughout, um, I think one thing that I've learned in this, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's such a hyper local role in, in so many ways. Right. And, and, and I would say even in a, a role like this, uh, the, um, the ways in which I've learned, you know, uh, that people aren't necessarily supportive of, uh, <laughs> right. If they, people who disagree with you will very much let it be known. Um, but people who agree have, have you know, or uh, don't have a lot of time <laughs> and may not step in to actually support you when they actually agree with the, the work that you're doing. And so, you know, as an example, like we're, we're, um, uh, we're pushing LGBTQ plus ed standards through. And um, the moment that, you know, I, I will say it's, it's, Folks who don't live in DC, but I, I do get a lot of emails because of it from folks from outside of DC. And um, uh, if you ask most people, they're they're supportive. But unfortunately, what that looks like when you look at like public comments on our standards is a lot of people from out of town saying that they don't support it, and very few people chiming in to say that they do, even though that's not representative of what our city actually believes, right? And so. Um, I think, you know, if I, if I could ask for my, my cry for help is like, uh, it goes back to what Aaron was saying, like, please, please get involved because it's hard to make the case of, you know, this is something that, you know, our constituents want or that DC wants. Uh, if, if it's not at the extremes of, I really want this to happen, or I really don't want this to happen. If it's anywhere in the middle, there's very little engagement around it, unfortunately. And those are the things that make it really hard actually to uh, to push something through. So actually comments on those things. Don't just say, oh, those look great, but like actually express it because there's gonna be some people who will express their distaste for it or what have you on there. Um, you know, there's there's a lot happening right now. There's a lot of visual, like I mentioned earlier, um, education is really just hard in our country for a lot of reasons. Um, Kind of curious, like with all of this happening, what keeps you in this work? You know, like why continue to fight um, given several headwinds um, in the way? Um, Aaron, I'll throw it over to you first. Absolutely. You know, I think that for me, keeping it on the topic of the schools and, and the students and stuff, I think that doing this work and seeing the students, seeing the kids, seeing the teachers, getting the messages from the parents, from the students, from the teachers, about their struggles, about their victories, about the things that they're working on and about how much they care about these issues, how much they care about seeing people like us in their own school boards as teachers, seeing, seeing themselves represented in their teachers, talking about how important it is to have that safe and accepting space in a school at the school level. And so I think that for me, one of the biggest things that keeps me in this work is the joy, like the, the queer joy that so many of us know and love, that we 
know helps fuel us for the work that we do. And, and it's, it's why I'm in it. I, you know, I, I think that every single queer person out there should get to experience what a fully loving and accepting environment is and should be able to be themselves freely and openly around others who are like them freely and openly as well. Um, and whenever I see that happen, it makes me happy and I want to make that happen for more people. <laughs> I love that so much. I'm like very warm right now as a result of that. And I love to be able to share that there. Um, Alistair, what keeps you in the work as well? I love that, Erin. And thank you for thinking about this and, uh, you know, across the, across the country. And um, it's, it's so, it's so powerful uh, to, to even in this short time, be able to hear from what you're learning uh, across, across, across the work. Uh, for, for me, it's, it still comes back to, the work that I've been doing. I mean, it's um, uh, it, it's I, I I define literacy as as a way to navigate the world, and I think as part of that, it's not just learning how to read, but also learning how to distinguish fact from fiction and primary sources from you know opinion and uh, health literacy and um, financial literacy, and a big part of that is cultural literacy, right? And being able to uh, actually, and I think this is such a big problem for us, um, also in DC, have a conversation with someone who disagrees with you, right? And um, so much of that I feel like is hard, uh, harder and harder as we become more polarized, right? And so um, being able to, uh, in, in, in many ways, also just be that voice in a room sometimes as the only person who's raising that um, just, I think, is is so important to foster that as well as just the broader, the broader work that I focus on in the weeds, which uh, is much more uh, Jinsu, as you know, much more, much drier and and <laughs> uh, so. I, I think I think it's so important though because you you know you mentioned cultural literacy, you mentioned the different forms of literacy, and one of the things that I think really helps LGBTQ youth you know, engage with their communities and figure out what their place is within their communities is that sort of cultural literacy as well as political literacy, the literacy of how to navigate all of the complex forces that are operating on us, especially as students, because there are a lot of pressures on students and for queer students, those pressures are magnified. And so the work that you do is, is extremely important especially in DC, as you mentioned, with the literacy rates that we are trying to achieve here for our students and with the large number of LGBTQ students we have in DC. DC is one of the, if, if all of you are not aware, DC is one of the queerest places in the country. Um, one in 35 people in DC are transgender. That is a astronomical number. And so for the students, that is especially important because um, that generation has has felt more free to be themselves. And so literacy, anything that affects literacy in DC by virtue also affects LGBTQ literacy because of our huge population here. I didn't know that's that about one in 35. Wow. And that and that and that is just trans. Whenever we talk about LGBT people, we are we're soaring. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, you know, we have uh, leaders on this call, young queer leaders who are invested in the work um, and work to help make sure schools remain safe spaces. Um, you've already mentioned some advice on, you know, showing up, commenting, doing other things on there. Uh, what other advice would you have uh, for members uh, who are hearing this call or hearing the recording of uh, ways that they can help? Do you want to take that or me? It, it, I can. Okay, really? yeah, sure, okay. sure, sure. Absolutely. Um, I think that for local LGBTQ leaders, building your strong community support networks is so important. Finding the people that are professionally going to be in support of you, both allies and other queer people. Finding the students and helping support them, helping them build their own networks. Because I think that no matter where you are, if you're in the most accepting place, having a strong network of support is going to help you feel empowered. If you are in a place that is targeting you, that's how the queer community has survived this long. That is how we have thrived this long, is even through the most oppressive eras for LGBTQ people, it is those close-knit support networks that got us through. And I think that like holding true to that and remembering that origin of who we are today politically and actively and in society and culturally is going to be important in the future, you know, helping foster that both at the professional level, at the local level and at the student level. 
I love and that. Echo, oh, and I'll just say, Echo, like there's lots of great folks that I've met through the Victory Fund, the Next Gen Network, and others. Um, so this is a great place to find community, both virtual and in person on there um, to kind of continue the work. Sorry, Alistair, I cut you off. Go ahead. Uh, well, I think DC, like most uh, school boards, boards of ed, don't really have that many staff, right? So some of the folks who have reached out, especially, I mean, DC is such a policy wonk city that I've reached out and said like, hey, can I help with some policy analysis? I mean, like, absolutely, <laughs> please, 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 because it really helps us move the work forward. So everything from like the technical help, uh, I mean, we're, we're still, I mean, I, I think I, I show up at, at school meetings now and I, I do think that people think of me in a certain way, but I, I, I'm still this one person sitting behind a computer trying to sort this all out uh, at the end of the day. And so any any help that we can get, I'm not going to be in that short amount of time an expert at all of these issues, right? So we try to we try to get as much as we can from from the uh, testimonies and from what we can read and 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 at the end of the day at local local levels like this, um, capacity is just so limited, right? So so that kind of help actually, in addition to what I was saying around you know showing up. Um, and uh, working in coalition and building those coalitions uh, makes a big difference. And all, you know, local politics is local politics. It's 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 so uh, trust based. I would say, right, based on um, relationships that you build here. And so, uh, uh, you know, helping to build out those networks and actually get people to care. I think DC is also particular because we have federal politics to also think about here, uh, and. And I think local politics gets forgotten. And so, so actually paying attention to what's happening at the local local level and getting involved, you can actually make a big difference there. Um, and it it is immediate in a lot of ways, right? You, you can take out the trash tomorrow. And that, that I find really, really uh, exciting. Yeah, and as I see Maxwell post on here, you know, most politics is local and as Ben encouraged, like reach out, you know, people are like, you may think they have like a full staff, but they may not, like as Alice was noting, um, and they could use your help on here. Um, my final question to you both before we open up to audience, audience Q&A um, is kind of leave us um, this part on a moment of hope. Um, what's, you know, from your work or your research, um, what's a story that you came across that really just inspired you? Um, and I'll pass it over to Aaron first for this one. Cool, cool, cool. Um, from my work, I think that what is inspiring me right now, the thing that continues to give me a little bit of hope in the face of all of the anti-LGBTQ legislation that is sweeping the country right now, is that it seems to be in several places um, going in, in the other direction. And so, we are seeing more pushes for fully inclusive curriculum right now. We are seeing more pushes for, for LGBTQ inclusive policies in schools. Uh, here in Maryland, they're, they're pushing several pieces of legislation that will protect trans and queer students. And in California, we just saw SB 107, which protects transgender kids and transgender students in the state. We're seeing the same thing in, uh, in Minnesota, where um, I believe one of the Victory Fund candidates, uh, uh, Lee Finke, uh, trans, um, representative there is is pushing a, a very comprehensive piece of legislation that protects the rights of transgender students within the borders. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing very good indications that like where we are making headway, we are flying and we are helping the students in these in these places. So like, you know, I see Alistair, you know, you're you're here in D.C. and like D.C. just passed the human rights sanctuary law just last last year. And and like seeing these seeing the recognition that like things are getting bad in other places, we need to be extra sure that we're protecting our students is so important. Great work happening around the country, um, which is, I mean, we have to remember there, there are really, really great things happening despite some of the awful things happening in other places right now and could work to fight those. Exactly. Um, leave us with um, a wonderful story and inspiring story. <laughs> uh, my students again because they're pushing the boundaries and I love that right I mean when the students testify about our our newest draft of social study standards it's not enough that we're in queer including queerness right they're they're naming things like hey why is it that in this grade queerness is only mentioned as a group that's discriminated against like where's the wh what about the other stuff there's like what about queer culture what about the things that 
you know, describe and and bring teach about queerness not in relation to something that has, you know, it's not just, you know, a group that was uh, singled singled out in the Holocaust, right? It's it's everything else too that they're pushing for. And or another another <laughs> testimony that I love that inspired me was like students coming in and saying like, hey, why is queerness only done in the U.S. context? Right. I mean, that that's the level of conversation I get really excited about because it's it's um it's uh yeah that that's <laughs> mm -hmm. that's awesome to hear that uh that they're like it's not just about oppression we also have to hear about queer joy and like where in the culture we are and um, I love that the students are the ones that are really pushing it um that's amazing to hear there um I'm gonna pass it off to my colleague uh, Ben Schuster. All right. Um, hey, y'all. Um, and thank you to Aaron and Alistair. Um, you both are so inspiring. So thank you for being here. Um, I've just been like sitting here in awe, like kind of hearing all your thoughts. Um, and I, I feel really hopeful again, despite everything that's going on. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of things to be worried about, but it sounds like there's also a lot to be hopeful about. Um, and so got a few questions from the audience. Um, wanted to start uh, with this one. So um, this came from a question, uh, this came from someone who's in a more conservative state, um, and it's what can we do to support students right now, um, especially in those states, just kind of given this onslaught of policy, um, everything that's been going on. Um, we'd love to hear both of your thoughts, um, but I guess, Aaron, um, if you feel comfortable, um, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. And I think like this is going to depend on what your um, what your role is within your local educational community and your local community at large. But one thing that I've noticed in several, even some of the most conservative states is the willingness of teachers of local school boards to buck what the state is telling them to do, to just push it away and say, no, I'm not going to discriminate against my students. I don't care what you do. We're going to protect our trans and queer students. We're going to protect our LGBTQ students. And I think that's part of the value of having like a, a really strong local school board in making a statement and taking a stand for your local community and for your local students. Because in the end, even in a lot of these more conservative states, they like to push the, the values of quote unquote local control and parental control. And so if you as a local community come together and say, well, this is what we want. We do want LGBTQ inclusion in our schools. We don't care what you pass at the state level. We're going to push for protection for our students. Um, a lot of times there are no mechanisms for them to stop it. And so, you know, this is just one thing that I think um, I've seen positively done in some of the more rural and conservative states. Finding every single nook and cranny that you can support those students in uh, is important. Yeah, so it sounds like there are like a lot of ways sort of to like use the logic kind of against them. They're saying everything is local. Well, of course it is. And, you know, let's leave get... it to us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I love that. Um, awesome. So another question we had, um, and I think you both kind of touched on this, um, but love, would love to hear kind of again, um, based on this question, but uh, where do you see things going in the next five to 10 years? Um, are you optimistic? You know, again, it sounds like there's a lot of really good stuff happening. Um, in places like Colorado, Illinois, you mentioned Aaron in Maryland and California. Um, where do you see things going? And, um, you know, how can we kind of be a part of that, um, that movement? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, jumping in again, and I, I think that one of the important things that I'm seeing, um, for all of you here, some of you might remember, depending on, on like your age and how closely you're following politics at the time, um, 2003 to 2005, and it was the it was almost entirely analogous to what's going on right now in in our country. Um, but instead of trans people and queer people, it was gay people, and it was the right to marry. And we saw several we saw a couple states pass laws that allowed gay people to marry, and then a, ma a mass national backlash to that. We saw 30 states pass anti gay marriage amendments, and it looked the way then that it does now. How there was it seemed like everything was getting really dark, and that like states were going to start targeting gay people to the extreme in new and creative ways. Um, and it took a little while to come out of that. But the activists that we built in that time were the ones that were responsible for. Obergefell. We're the ones that were responsible for the gaining of the rights to marry. We're the ones that were responsible for the social change that we saw around acceptance of gay people at the time. And so whenever I get asked often, like, well, where do I see us in five to 10 years? I think that that answer is probably different at five years than it is at 10 years. I do think that in the next 
three to five years, things might get a little bit difficult for people. But I also do think that, you know, the moral arc of the universe build, bends towards justice. And I think that, um, look, taking the long view, the activists that we are building right now will be the ones that secure this right for all of our future generations. Um, so just keep fighting, you know? I've, I literally have chills. That's, yes, all that. Um, Alistair, do you have thoughts on that question? Um, Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Aaron. I, I appreciate that that historical context too. It, it really helps to put things in perspective. And, um, you, know, you know, Ben, I, I think about this uh, again within just thinking about public education uh, within that context too. And, and um, you know, uh, in, in many jurisdictions, teacher retention right now is at an all-time low. It's really hard to be a teacher right now, just generally. I mean, and this, this that, you know, uh, chaos that's being sown, right, is also pushing a lot of teachers away from doing the job. And so um, back to that last question, in terms of how we support our students, I think my, my, my ask is actually uh, asking for supporting public education more broadly too, because if we, <laughs> if, if, you know, all the good teachers are leaving uh, and, and want to do something else, uh, because it's the, the job is just becoming so uh, pleased, right? Uh, it's, it's very hard for us to fix any of these other problems, right? And, and it, it's scaffolded on, on, on top of one another. I also see uh, a lot of, um, I, I'm optimistic about the, the ways in which a lot of our public institutions are transcending state boundaries, right? So I think about, you know, DC Public Library, many public libraries immediately have said, uh, if you're in a state with a book ban, you can get a DC Public Library card and we'll ship it to you, right? <laughs> like those, those, those things also get me really excited because I think as we move into this world where, yeah, a lot of these policies are super local, but the way that we can support students across borders is not necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be that contained, right? So um, I, I, I do see ways that we can continue helping and, and helping us move towards that, that, um, that moral arc that, that Aaron was naming. Alistair, I love that so much. The fact that that we can, as a local community, not only support the people in our local community, but show that representing our local community, we care about people in our state. We care about people nationally. We care about people globally. And seeing a local community do that, I think, speaks so highly of both the community itself and the people representing it. Yeah, that is that's beautiful, and it kind of like echoes, I think, a lot of what we've seen with like the abortion bans. Um, you know, having rights kind of transcend. Um, state borders and um, just kind of highlights like compassion is like contagious you know you should just be there for one another um, so I think that's that's beautiful um, cool so last question here um, Alistair I know you kind of touched on hearing direct feedback from students in DC. Um, so this this question is maybe more geared toward that, um, but it's how do you keep in touch uh, with your local community, um, you know, that's affected by these issues? Um, how have you, like, what have you seen work? What have you seen not work? Um, kind of in that context as you sort of get that, um, that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a great question because, you know, I just named, if you only listen to the people who testify, you don't really get a full slice of what's going on. And Twitter is kind of that too, right? So um, I find that uh, yeah, when I go to the farmer's market and just talk to anyone, um, this is a whole other thing, but I spend a lot of time at laundromats. So talking to people on the laundromat uh, is, a, is, a, is, is right, but, but catching people who don't necessarily go out of their way to share their perspective or their experience, I feel like is so much more important actually um, in this work, especially at the local, local level. Um, and of course, going to schools, but you know, a lot of the uh, parent-teacher organizations, same thing, right? It's the parents who show up, um, I want their perspective, um, but often it's not actually representative of most people's perspective, right? And, and so my, my challenge, and I, I think this is where uh, I think we we all have to put a lot of a lot more work in is is capturing the experiences and perspectives of the folks who can't make a Tuesday six p.m. meeting right and 
um, and and um, and and how we do that in a way that also is 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 uh, is done with is done right without you know being abusive of people's time, which is a really scarce resource, right? Is um, is something that I think is is a, is a challenge for all local politics. Yeah, sounds like kind of like making making things accessible and sort of meeting people where they're at. Um, cause again, like, um, kind of personally, I've been trying to get more involved in like New York city politics and they have these meetings during work and it's like, wait, how can I get involved when I have a meeting that day? And so, um, yeah, definitely thinking of ways to just make more government, more accessible, um, I think is huge. So yeah, well said, um, awesome. So, um, thank you both, um, so much. Um, it's been an absolute honor to have both your perspectives, um, just want to quickly kind of highlight um, what's up next for next gen this year. And so, um, Ryan, not sure if you have a slide. Um, I'm also happy to share my screen here. Um, but yeah, just kind of want to highlight what's next for next gen um, for all of you that have attended. And so, this is our calendar. Awesome. This is our calendar of events um, for the upcoming year. And so on the virtual side, um, we have a campaigns 101 in May, where we'll be highlighting um, sort of like how to run for office and talking to people who have been involved in campaigns um, to sort of get advice on what that process looks like. That could be, you know, from your perspective, looking to run for office, looking to join a campaign, looking to fundraise, you know, kind of everything that goes into that. Um, and so I think that'll be a really great topic. Um, we're also, of course, celebrating Pride in June, and so we'll sort of be highlighting some young LGBTQ leaders that are doing the work, um, that are sort of really proudly representing our community in public office. Um, really excited for that, that one. And then in person, um, and so this is kind of based on where you're at, um, and you're also more than welcome to fly in. Maybe there's kind of a weekend that sort of aligns with one of these when you're in these cities, we'd love to meet you in person. And so we have a Chicago happy hour at Sidetrack. Um, it's a super fun queer bar um, uh, that I've heard a lot of great things about. I've never been, but um, we'll look forward to going. Uh, we'll look to bring the community together in that way. And then in DC, um, likely kind of aligned with our national our international leadership conference at the end of the year in December, um, we'll be meeting again um, to kind of highlight the work that NextGen is doing, but also the entire work at the Victory Fund and Institute. So, um, yeah, that's kind of everything here. Um, I see there are, um, you know, there are links in the chat. Please sign up for our Facebook group. Please join our LinkedIn. Please get on our email list. Um, we are so happy uh, to have you all um, a part of this network. We're going to continue to build. We're going to continue to work on the issues that we highlighted today with regard to education and representation, um, but also just like kind of getting us all involved and in making the process of getting involved in politics for queer people more accessible um, and more attainable for all of us. And so really excited to be on this journey with all of you. Um, and thank you again so much to Aaron and Alistair. Um, your perspectives are so important. The work you're doing is so important. Um, and I just, I had chills, so um, really appreciate it. 